In this video I'm going to show you how to run and interpret a finite mixture regression with R. Finite mixture regression is a very powerful exploratory technique you can use after you've run a normal regression. Because with finite mixture regression you can identify so-called unobserved heterogeneity in your data. So you can look whether the regression results are the same for all your observations or whether you have discrete subgroups that differ in the regression results. So maybe one predictor has a stronger effect in one group than in the other group. And maybe it doesn't have any effect in the third group. This can be a very powerful tool, especially later on for the discussion section of your paper or your thesis, because it can help you to point out possible directions for further research. That is where, where to look maybe for some moderator variables. The difference to the moderated regression is, in a moderated regression you have a specific variable as a possible moderator. And you test whether this moderator changes the effect between predictor and criterion variable. Here you don't have a moderator. You're just looking at whether there are groups where the effects differ from each other, without at this time knowing why they differ from each other. To run a finite mixture regression we can use the library FlexMix. I will show you this procedure with an example data set contained in this package. We have a continuous predictor x1, a factor variable as a predictor x2, and the criterion variable. The covariate w I don't use in this example. If you want to know more about this example data set, you could use the help function. First I show you how to run a finite mixture regression with a pre-specified number of groups. In this case, two groups or two components. That is here I'm assuming that in my data set there will be two latent groups that differ when it comes to the regression results. This is mainly for didactic reasons. Normally you don't know in advance how many latent groups you have. And later on we will look at how to get to the correct number of latent groups. So we use the function flexmix. The first part you know from the LM function. This is just the regression formula. The last part the data frame. What's new is this parameter k equals 2. This is the number of components. So here I run a finite mixture regression based on two latent components. Let's look at the results. Two groups, one with size 97, the other with 103. The order of the groups is random. So it's quite possible that with the same data you would get more or less the same groups but in a different order. So it's possible that for you my group 1 would be the group number 2 and vice versa. Prior probability isn't that interesting. What's interesting is posterior probability above 0. For the group 1 there were 194 cases with a non-zero pro probability of being assigned to that group. And from those 194, 97 were actually assigned to that group. So only 50% of those that have a non-zero probability of being in that group are assigned to that group in the end. Down here we get some information criteria. We will use them later on when we compare different numbers of latent groups. Now we want to see, okay, what are the regression results in those two groups? For that, we use the summary function on the result of the refit function. Here are the regression re results for the first group and here for the second group. And the key difference here is the effect of the first predictor, x1. In the first group it has a po significantly positive relationship to the dependent variable, whereas in group 2 it does not have a significant relationship. Especially with, with a larger number of groups it's easier to compare the parameters if we see them side by side. We can do this using the parameters function. Now we get the regression weights for the different latent groups. The more realistic case is that we don't know in advance how many latent groups there will be in our data. For that we use the step flexmix function. This function tries out different numbers of latent components. If you want to know more about this function you can use the help function. The key parameters we start again with a regression formula. Then with k we give the number of latent components. In this example I try out between 1 and 5 components. And rep number of repetitions. Here I usually put in 10. The reason for that, there is a random element in this procedure. So it's possible to get different results for the same number of latent groups 
if you run it repeatedly. And this leads to the algorithm running this 10 times for each number of groups and taking the best result. And of course we need our data frame. Here we see 5 rows of 10 stars, because we have 5 different numbers of components and 10 repetitions each. Let's look at the result. Important is the column converged, because only if there is a true you can trust the results. Here is the number of components and there are different information criteria. I look primarily at the BIC and especially at the ICL. The ICL is a variant of the BIC which has been developed specifically for finite mixture models. And for those comparative values, a low value is better than a high value. Looking at BIC and ICL, there we have a clear picture. The best model there is model number th three, that is three components. We can look at this on a graph as well with a plot function. And here as well, we can see based on BIC and ICL, the three latent components, that is three different classes, is the best solution. So later on we will be looking at this three component solution. In order to extract this three component solution, because we've run a lot of different solutions, we use the get model function and put in the number three as the number of groups we want to extract. And this should look familiar because we've looked at a similar table at the start of this tutorial. Now we have one group with 70 participants, one with 100 and one with 30. And again we have the number of participants with a non-zero probability to be assigned to that group and this ratio. Now we are interested in seeing the three regression results. Because we have three groups with three different regression results. With group 2 we can see here we have no significant effect of x1 of the continuous predictor. Whereas for the other two groups, x1 has an effect and it's quite similar. But the difference for those two primarily lies in the effect of x2. Because that effect is stronger with group 1 than within group 3. And to make it easier to compare these results, we use the parameters function. And here we can see side by side the results for the different regression weights in the three groups. In addition, we can call a so-called rutogram. A rutogram is something similar to a histogram with two key differences here. One difference, on the y-axis we get the square root of the frequency and we only see the observations in this rutogram with a posterior probability that is non-zero. And what we like to see is a very large column on the right side. So now we want to see which observations are assigned to which group. First we can get the posterior probabilities and we can get the clusters. We will be looking at only the first five rows to make it a little bit easier to compare. So the posterior probabilities, this is the first observation. This goes with a more or less zero probability in group 1, with a probability of 0.18 in group 2 and a probability of 0.82 in group 3. 0.82 is the largest probability, so this will be assigned to group 3. This can, we can see here with a cluster function. Second row, zero probability for group 1, zero for probability for group 2, and probability of basically 1 for group 3. So again, assigned to group 3, and so on. The really interesting part for your exploratory analyses is the cluster. That is, to which cluster this case is assigned with the highest probability, because you can use that to investigate possible reasons for why one is assigned to a certain cluster. Here I've added the variable cluster as a result of the finite mixture regression to my original data frame. And now I can use this to investigate possible reasons why someone is assigned to a certain cluster. For that I use the describe by function from the psych library. And now I can look at all my variables in my data frame to check whether they differ between those groups, because that would be a possible indication that this variable could predict the group membership. In this example I don't have much. The only thing I have as an additional variable is w, and yes, in this case it's possible that this could be an explanation for the group membership, because we can see the mean of w for group 1 is lower than in group 3, which again is lower than in group 2. So here you would look at all the other scales and socioeconomic indicators you have in your data. Age, gender, whatever you have. Because that could lead 
to ideas for follow-on moderation analyses. And finally, it can be helpful to plot the results of this finite mixture regression. So for each continuous predictor variables, and here we have only one, x1, you can run a scatter plot and color code the cluster membership. Here we can see that for one group, the red dots, there is no effect of x1 on y, that for the other two groups, the effect is almost the same. So the slopes for the black dots and the green dots is basically the same, which we of course have seen in the data. But I think it's helpful to visualize this. And if you had more than one continuous predictor variable, you would run such a plot for each continuous predictor variable and the criterion variable. With that, I've reached the end of this introduction to finite mixture regression with R. I hope this has been helpful for you. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.